Hello and welcome everyone to another Applied Flow Technology webinar. My name is Nick Vastine. I'm a business applications engineer here with AFT. And today we're going to be talking about reverse flow through pumps. So this is the final installment of our pump concept series. And so we'll look at some of the prevention methods. We'll sort of touch on them, some of the different modeling options that you have in the AFT Impulse. And then the bulk of the webinar will be focused on what four quadrant data is, four quadrant kind of analysis, and going into a lot of depth to understand it conceptually. Then we can see how we can apply that in the software to hopefully more accurately model reverse flow through your pump. So where do we start? As I mentioned, this is part of a pump concept series. This is actually the final installment. So if you followed along and made it this far, I hope it's created a lot of value and hopefully you understand pumps a bit more in depth now. So this is the fourth installment addressing reverse flow, which we'll go into depth today. But we also have all these other topics. We have back to basics, looking at sizing, affinity laws, pump configurations, a lot of the things you'll learn in your fundamental physics or fundamental fluids class. Second webinar focused on reliable operation, so addressing efficiency standards like allowable operating region, preferred operating region, uh, using variable frequency drives to meet intended operating points instead of control valves and other things like net positive suction head. The previous webinar looked at pump transients, so looking at startups and trips, and then also looking at controlled startups where you can gradually ramp up the speed of a pump compared to inertially modeling it, where you're relying on torque information primarily to inform the rate at which a pump starts up or trips. So with that in mind, a lot of the kind of more common topics that are seen in pump and hydraulic analysis won't be covered in excruciating depth in this webinar. But if you do have questions, if I use some terminology that you're not familiar with, definitely consider going back through the series and looking through those. Again, it's a foundation that builds on itself every uh, iteration. So all of these are available as recordings on our YouTube channel, or you can find them on our website from our learning center. So if you're able to register for this webinar, hopefully you have a good idea of how to navigate our website and you can find those other recordings as well. So without further ado, let's take a look at what we're going to talk about today. First, we'll look kind of fundamentally what happens during reverse flow. We'll look at our different options to model reverse flow and AFT impulse. That includes using a standard pump curve, which is what you'll have from a manufacturer. And then as I mentioned, the bulk of the webinar will be focused on four quadrant modeling. What is this four quadrant analysis? What are the four quadrants that we're talking about? Where do you get this information for a pump? We won't go into too much depth here since you know you can't reveal everything at the start of the webinar, gotta keep you engaged. We'll look at how to select a four quadrant data set. So that depends on different factors like the specific speed of your pump, what dimensional reference point that you're using, whether that's the best efficiency point or a steady state operating point some of the implications on your analysis, and then finally, how to perform sensitivity analysis on this four quadrant data set, making sure that you're accurately representing your system. Finally, we'll do some other analysis considerations when you are looking at reverse flow, and especially when you are using a four quadrant data set, what things should you be aware of? So that way, when you're performing this analysis in AFT Impulse yourself, you're aware of potential issues and you understand the implications of each of the changes that you're making to your model. So pretty full schedule, again, starting kind of from fundamentals, but a lot of it builds on existing pump topics. So again, if you ever feel out of your depth, definitely consider reviewing those other pump concepts and then coming back to this webinar at a later date. So what are some reverse flow considerations, some of the causes and how you might prevent reverse flow through your pump. So if you don't have reverse flow through your pump, that's an easy way to resolve it. You don't have to try to model it, but in most cases that isn't going to happen. So if you imagine your pump, and we're primarily looking at centrifugal pumps, then sustained reverse flow is not really good for a pump because it's not designed to operate in that way. So it's generally designed to suck liquid in through the impeller or through the eye of the impeller, push it out and then out through the sides. Whereas if you have reverse flow, now it's sucking in through the sides and pumping out through the eye of the impeller, which is less than ideal. The sustained reverse flow, it can also re result in reverse rotation, a lot of alliteration. And that reverse rotation would be the impeller of the pump physically 
revolving the opposite direction it was intended to spin. That can be bad, especially if it's connected to a motor. In some cases, it may be intentional, like if you have a turbine where you can capitalize on that rotation and turn it into electricity. But in general, it seems more likely to damage your equipment than to create a benefit to your system. Most often, this is caused by two different factors. The first is a pump trip while pumping against increasing elevation or pressure. So if you imagine why you would add a pump to a system, it's overcoming system losses that gravity can't overcome by itself. So if you're pumping up a hill, you're overcoming all the elevation gain of that hill, or if you're pumping to higher pressure, you're going against the natural driving force that fluid wants to move in from high pressure to low pressure. The pump is what does that. So when the pump trips, you're removing that change in driving force, and now all the fluid is gonna go from that high elevation or the high pressure back down to the low elevation or low pressure where you were pumping from. To do that, it has to flow through the pump, causing potentially reverse flow. So pretty intuitive. The second case is a pump trip during parallel pump operation. Again, this is the same case of having a high pressure on the downstream of the pump, and a low pressure on the upstream. That's kind of the whole point of a pump is to generate pressure, which ultimately generates flow, right? So in parallel pump operation, let's say you have three different pumps that are running, one of them will trip. Now, all of a sudden that pump isn't contributing to that pressure gain, but it still sees the high pressure on its outlet and the low pressure on its inlet. And so reverse flow wants to go through that tripped pump. All the other pumps are still creating that pressure differential, and that's what drives reverse flow through that parallel pump station. So those are the big two causes, but anywhere that you're pumping from low pressure to high pressure, and that high pressure can be sustained on its own, that's somewhere that reverse flow can occur, and a lot of these considerations that we're going to look at today will come up. Now, most pumps are not going to have free reign in terms of reverse flow occurring. Most often check valves will be applied at the outlet of a pump specifically to prevent the sustained reverse flow. So if you ever look at a parallel pumping station, you'll be protecting each of those different pumps with their own check valve, just in case they do trip, you're gonna minimize the amount of reverse flow that goes through it. Uh, if you're familiar with check valves, rarely will they close at exactly zero reverse flow at exactly zero velocity. And instead there's always gonna be some amount of reverse flow and in other cases, such as really large cooling water systems where you have massive water mains, or if you have slurries, those may not use a check valve at all, in which case you do have to address the reverse flow and the potential for reverse flow in your system rather than relying on a check valve and potentially creating check valve slam as well. Other systems that don't have check valves, they might also have power operated valves. So it could be an emergency shutdown valve if the pump trips, you know, electronically close this valve. But in some cases, those may not be designed to close during a trip event, in which case you will see sustained reverse flow, and that sustained reverse flow can lead to that reverse rotation of the impeller. So all in all, not great. You don't want to see reverse flow through your pumps, but a lot of transient analysis is how do you address the problems that you don't want to occur in your system? And so that's what we'll go through today is how do we and model this and get a better understanding of what's happening in our system so that we can mitigate it and hopefully prevent it either with equipment or changes to our procedure. So what happens during reverse flow? Now we're going to look in the context of at the pump, system boundaries are changing and it's driving towards reverse flow. So here we're going to have an example. Uh, we're going to have the driving force for flow in a system change as an upper reservoir fills from other sources. So imagine we're pumping up a hill, we're pumping up to some Olympic sized swimming pool. And as we're doing that, it's filling from other sources. Maybe there's a flood event, maybe it's storm water, something else. And as that upper reservoir fills, what we're gonna see is the pressure demand from the pump continues to increase. It has to overcome more and more pressure as that upper reservoir fills. We can look at that in the context of a pump system curve. So here we have the pump curve, and then here we have the system curve where they intersect is our operating point. As that upper reservoir fills, you see an increase in the static head component. So it shifts it up vertically. Again, bringing your operating point in. So it has to operate at a higher pressure at an overall lower flow rate. It'll continue to go on until eventually the pump deadheads. It's unable to 
create enough pressure to drive flow through the system just because the pump at this point would be undersized. Obviously, this is a less than ideal case if your upper reservoir is filling beyond a level that you would have anticipated. Let's say that the reservoir keeps filling. At a certain point, the flow direction will reverse and the pump is still running, but it's no longer creating pressure. It's no longer creating forward flow. It's just kind of churning the water that's going through it in the reverse direction. In that sense, it's sort of creating back pressure, which resists flow. And that's what we would see here is with our pump curve, it would sort of expand into this negative flow region and have some amount of, in this case, head loss because now the flow direction has changed as well. So in positive flow, it's creating that pressure that should be what's driving flow forward. But if the system changes, now you could see reverse flow and instead it's creating that head loss essentially. Depends on what direction you're looking at. This can be a little bit confusing. But think of it as it's creating back pressure to resist that flow going through it. We'll take a look at what this looks like in the software after we take a look at our different modeling options. But before that, how your system is going to respond or how your model is going to respond is going to depend largely on your system and then also on your modeling assumptions. So again, in this pretty extreme example where we're pumping up to a reservoir and we're filling that upper reservoir, if the pump continues to operate at a constant speed, it'll create that sustained back pressure. You can kind of think of it as more and more flow would go through it, it kind of acts like a resistance element where the more flow you go through it, the higher loss you would see. And so in that sense, it's also gonna have a lot of torque operating on that motor to keep it going in that forward direction. So something operating at constant speed, that's sort of the initial assumption in a lot of impulse models, but it may not be true. And it all depends on how much torque that your motor can provide before it ultimately fails and pump trips due to a uh, catastrophic failure like the motor failing. What you can instead do is trip your pump. So instead of letting it reach the point where the motor uh, maxes out and then starts to break, it could trip the pump and then that would avoid damage to the surrounding components. It would avoid spinning the motor in the reverse direction and then would ultimately create less loss as the flow goes through it. Again, now there's no resistance for the flow as it goes backwards through the pump. And so it would create a lower overall DH. If you think about it from an infinity law perspective, maybe this DH would decrease as it's free to spin. It's causing less resistance to the flow as it goes through it. So how do you model this reverse flow in AFT impulse? There's two options. This is a screenshot from our pump properties window where you have the standard pump curve and the four quadrant curve. The standard pump curve is generally what you input. If you're starting from a fathom model, this is gonna be your manufacturer curve. And it's gonna use that curve during normal operation during forward flow. So in 99% of your cases, especially when you're designing for steady state, hopefully you don't have a reverse flow case. And so your standard pump curve is gonna cover most of those cases. On the off chance that there is reverse flow, which is convenient, which is why we're all here listening to this webinar, the deadhead of the pump is fixed at that pump, regardless of the amount of reverse flow. So if we imagine our pump curve, where we have our D, H, and our Q that was specified, as it goes into the negative Q, it stays at that deadhead pressure, regardless of how far out you go and how much reverse flow you create. This means that it's acceptable at limited amounts of reverse flow. If you think of this head curve as a continuous line, then at very low amounts of flow, you will see the, essentially that dead head pressure, creating that back pressure, that resistance to reverse flow. But the further and further you go out, the less and less reliable that assumption is gonna be. You might be asking, what is a limited amount of reverse flow? Like everything in engineering, it depends. Uh, it depends on the magnitude of your original flow rate and how much it deviates. And one way that you can tell that is by comparing to something like a four quadrant curve. Again, if we're thinking conceptually, the pump is essentially creating that back pressure against reverse flow at this deadhead point at just below negative flow rate. So this could be good. This would be a good first approximation. In general, if you're not anticipating reverse flow, I wouldn't go through the steps of specifying a four quadrant curve. I would just specify my normal curve. Then as your transient analysis goes through the steps, as you do more scenarios and different tests, 
if you start seeing much more significant reverse flow, that's where you would want to consider something like a four quadrant curve, which again is what we're going to go into in a lot more depth through the rest of the webinar. So a four quadrant curve is the selection of a data set curve, which overrides your user specified pump curve. So even though you have this from the manufacturer and you've specified it, it doesn't capture what happens in this negative flow. And because of that, we can replace it with a data set that does, that'll be pretty similar to this pump. So what you lose in accuracy in this first quadrant, in normal operation, you gain by having more precise data in negative flow, and then as we'll see in negative speed, if you get that reverse rotation as well. So let's take a look at what this looks like in AFT Impulse. Let's see. So up top, we have a standard pump curve. This is specified just from manufacturer data where it's DH and Q. And we're using the standard pump curve. We don't have a check valve that'll prevent reverse flow. Obviously, if you anticipate reverse flow, like a parallel pumping station or you're pumping up a hill, a check valve would probably be a good precaution to minimize the amount of reverse flow. We have that same pump curve specified here. So here in blue, this is our standard pump curve or our supplier pump curve. And in green, we see a four quadrant curve. So in this green area, that's the actual pump curve that the model is gonna be using to determine its operating point. That can lead to some deviation that we'll get into a little bit, but it also provides more insight into this region. So when you go to negative Q, what DH and what losses would you anticipate going through that pump? Here we have that same four quadrant curve, but in this case, I've added another transient event where it'll trip as soon as it goes to a volumetric flow rate below zero. So once reverse flow starts, we'll trip the pump, we'll see what happens there. Again, in this case, instead of the standard pump curve, we've used the four quadrant curve, and in this case, we've automatically selected one. We'll see if this automatic selection is suitable, and we'll go through the steps of selecting a curve ourselves later in the webinar. So if we run the model, pretty fast runtime, pretty simple system. Obviously, the more complex, the more runtime you will see. And I like to go directly to graph results. So here we have our different pumps. We could add all three over, and then we could look at our different parameters. So we could look at pump speed. That'll be useful for modeling our pump trip. We can look at the volumetric flow rate or the velocity at the pump. And then we can also look at the pressure rise, the total stagnation pressure rise, and that'll tell us how the, first how the pump approaches deadhead and then how the um, pump starts creating losses as that reverse flow occurs. Before we get into that, one of the big pieces of transient analysis is having a hypothesis of what you expect to happen and then seeing if those results match. And then if those two things have discrepancies, how can you rectify it? So in our case, we're simulating that uh, filling reservoir, but we're doing it a little differently. So we have a fixed inlet pressure and then our outlet pressure, we have a transient event where our pressure at this point is gonna continually increase. So it's gonna increase from 60 feet of water to 270 feet, which should overcome the amount of head that this pump can add, which is only 110 about, and we should see sustained reverse flow through all of these different options. So as this pressure rises, we'll see how the pumps respond, look at their speed, their velocity, and then their pressure rise. So if we hit generate, on top, we can see the pump speed. We can see how in the cases where it doesn't trip, the standard pump curve and the four quadrant curve, it's fixed at 100%. And we can see how it goes to zero and then actually to negative speed for the pump trip. So this pump does see reverse flow, it does see reverse rotation. Here we can look at the velocity. So we can see as the pump deadheads, it's gonna approach zero. Here we can see some deviation because the pump curves themselves are specified differently at this point. And then here we can see where the four quadrant curve and the four quadrant trip diverge because of the trip event, the trip event itself. If we look at the pressure rise, we can see they're pretty consistent leading up to 
this velocity. And again, that'll be due to the discrepancies between those two pump curves. And then we can see how the pressure rise changes pretty significantly when the pump trips. So if we remember our slides, if we look at our standard pump curve, we have this piece, where at any negative flow rate, we're fixing it at this deadhead pressure. What that looks like in the software is past that zero velocity, which is about here, we can see that the pressure rise stagnation total stays at that 47.9 BSID. And so it's fixed at that because it doesn't have any more information. It's better to fix at a deadhead pressure that you know than try to make guesses and approximate what kind of losses you would see. We don't see that with the four quadrant curve because it does have information as it goes into this reverse flow regime. So here we see that the pressure rise actually increases. That could be a consequence of this fixed pump speed where the amount of torque on the pump is gonna be continually increasing. And then we can also see how when we trip the pump, that also significantly changes the pressure rise or the pressure loss caused by the pump during that reverse flow. So we can see that when the pump is actually tripped, this is just a coincidence, but it's pretty close to what that deadhead pressure is. In reality, you know, it's unlikely that these two numbers would be pretty similar. So this is kind of an introduction to how you would go about analyzing these. This would be a good firsthand comparison if you had a number of different four quadrant sets and you wanted to compare to how they perform compared to your standard pump curve. And a lot of this analysis doesn't have to be done in a single scenario. These could have just as easily been different scenarios and use multi-scenario graphing to select all those different scenarios and show it all on a single graph. So we'll show that in our second comparison when we start comparing different four quadrant curves as well. The big points to remember here is when you're using a standard pump curve, it's going to fix at that deadhead pressure regardless of the amount of reverse flow that it's seeing. That's sort of the benefit of using a four quadrant curve where we now have information for how this outlet velocity is going to go and we can see how that pressure rise will change accordingly. So by using four quadrant data, we get access to those and we can more precisely model them even though we don't have that information directly from a manufacturer. So a lot of the rest of the webinar as well, how do you pick which curve this is? How do you know that it's accurate? And then what are the implications on your actual analysis when you do swap these curves in? So hopefully that all makes sense so far and everyone's following along. Let's get into four quadrant modeling, everyone's favorite part, what everyone's been waiting for, what I was most excited for in creating this webinar, I'm sure. So during normal pump operation, let's think about a normal pump curve. A pump operates at positive head, positive flow, positive speed, and positive torque. So that means it's creating head, flow is going in the intended direction from the eye of the impeller out the volume and through the discharge. Its speed is positive, the impeller is spinning in the direction that the manufacturer intended it to, and then the torque is also positive. This relationship is defined by a pump curve and how those different variables interact. However, inherently a pump doesn't have to operate within this region. It can operate at any flow and any speed, and that all depends on system conditions. So if you horrendously missize your pump and it's way too small, you could see reverse flow going through it on startup. And if that reverse flow is sustained, then it can turn the impeller going the other way, causing reverse speed. Again, it all depends on the system context, which is a big theme with pumps. It's all about pump system interaction, never is a pump operating independently. So if we look at these other flow and speed regimes when it could be negative, it's not necessarily always both positive. This is gonna be described by the other quadrants. So that's the four and four quadrants. In quadrant one, that's where your kind of normal pump operation is gonna be, positive head, positive flow, positive speed, and positive torque. And then over here in quadrant two, this is where you see kind of initial reverse flow, where the pump is still going forward, but the system is sending flow backwards through it. If that reverse flow is sustained, it might move into the third quadrant and see reverse rotation. It could also be designed to do that if you're using a pump as a turbine, for example, where you want that reverse rotation, you want it to spin a motor and generate electricity. 
And then over here in the fourth quadrant where you have negative speed and positive flow. So from these four quadrants, similar to generating a pump curve in this first quadrant, we can look at the head and the torque of the pump in each of these quadrants, and that'll completely define our pump at any speed and any flow combination. So for example, if we're at positive speed and negative flow, like we're looking at our reverse flow events now, we'll have that data and that information to describe the head that it generates and then also the torque that it generates in case where it's still hooked up to a motor, for example. So we can take all that information and then we can non-dimensionalize it. So we can make it independent of the actual head that the pump creates. We can make it all relative and independent of the actual flow and speed that the pump is operating at. What that lets us do is it isolates the characteristics of the pump you can think of it sort of like a characteristic curve where specific types of valves are going to have very specific characteristics in terms of how they open, how much CV they let in based on different open percent. And along those same lines, pumps are going to be the same way. So a similar pump should operate similarly. And so by non-dimensionalizing it, it isolates those characteristics so that we can re-dimensionalize it and use it for our system. So this will be valuable when selecting analogous pumps without manufacturer data. So rarely will a manufacturer give you this data for all four quadrants. You're gonna mostly focus on that normal pump operation. That's pretty reasonable since steady state operating is gonna be the majority of your operation, I would hope. And so it's really only a worst case scenario when you're trying to look at this reverse flow or like those other cases when you're looking at very large water mains or slurries where you don't have a check valve and you don't have other prevention strategies in place that you have to address this reverse flow. So these are the four quadrants. Again, we want to look at how head changes and how torque changes anywhere on this plot. So what that means is we kind of have to make a 3D graph where we have a head value at this point, a head value at this point, a head value at this point, this point, this point, so on and so forth. A 3D graph is essentially a surface. So again, we see that same speed dimension, and then we see that same flow dimension. And then coming out of the page would be the dimensionless head in this case. So we can see how it increases significantly up here, a very negative flow and very positive speed. And at zero, zero, it should be zero head, right? So if the pump isn't operating, it shouldn't be generating any pressure at all. So we can take a surface like this, which is very dense in information, and we can also split it into something that's easier to read in a 2D form. So that's where you get these contour graphs. So you can see these same contours on the surface. Again, think of it like a topographical map where these are all equal headlines. The closer they are together, the faster that it ramps up in that direction. And then the further spaced apart, Obviously, the further apart it ramps up at that point. And again, we see here we have dimensionless flow, we have dimensionless speed. So at any point in here, we can determine what that head will be, not just in the forward normal pump operation based on a pump curve, but if it's still flowing in the reverse direction, but the pump is still running, or if you reach that reverse rotation, how it operates in this third quadrant. So those are the four quadrants. That's where you can take this sort of information. This would be largely test data. It can be expanded based on affinity laws to cover sort of everything. And then you can get it into a plot like this. And what that lets us do is capture this information even another way. So we're going a lot of layers deep. This is called the Suter method. The Suter method is used to describe this plot, which would be specific for a type of pump and how we can describe that head and torque at a range of different flow rates and speeds. So what we do is we pick a point. In this case, we're dimensionlessly looking at our flow, which is at one, represented by nu, and at our rated speed, which is one, which is represented by alpha. So in this case, this would be our best efficiency point, where this is our best efficiency point flow rate for whatever pump they were testing. This is the rated speed of the pump for whatever pump they were testing. And that's our new one reference point. From that, we can figure out the BEP head. And that's also going to be our one on this graph. 
what we can do is describe this with polar coordinates. And so here we're looking at our radial distance and we can describe where it is on the circle with this angle theta. So here's all the relationships. Don't worry, there won't be a quiz. We won't have to do math at the end of this. But this, again, provides kind of fundamental conceptual understanding of how this four quadrant uh, modeling works. So for this theta, you can have a theta all the way around the circle. And so now you can describe the head at any combination of flow and speed, whether that's all flow and zero speed or negative flow and negative speed, something like a turbine. Or in our case, if we're looking at positive speed, the pump is still running. It hasn't uh, spun the impeller the wrong way yet, but we do see reverse flow. We can determine the head at all of those different conditions. So from that, this is a I guess suitor diagram. I don't know if that's the correct technical term, but that's what we'll go with, where we have the head, and then we can also do that same relationship for the torque, which would inform uh, the inertia and how a pump might trip, for example. So the final thing to touch on, if this isn't enough and your brains aren't hurting, is you can take these curves and you can expand it via the affinity laws. So you can look at how these different heads will change based on different speeds. This is very valuable if a pump is tripping or if a pump is starting up because you're going to see that gradual change in speed. And in a lot of cases, this is how many of those data sets were developed. So they didn't actually test a pump in every single condition and then draw all of these lines and create a surface containing all of them. They would have tested a few different points and then used affinity laws to fill in the rest. So what that means is it's sort of like you're looking at expanding and shrinking this circle so that way the head will scale according to affinity laws as the speed and flow rate scales accordingly. So again, how do you get all of this information for all four quadrants, all of these different head points, how do you capture that so that you can use it in your simulation and not introduce a whole bunch of uncertainty in terms of how you're applying it? So that's the most conceptual part of four quadrant modeling. That brings us to the different data sets. So if we think about this curve where we have all of these headlines, this is going to be specific to one type of pump. So for any range of pumps, again, ideally you would have each one specific to your pump, sort of like how you have a pump curve specific to your pump. But because this reverse flow operation is so rare, it's not really valuable for pump manufacturers to get that reverse flow and negative speed, negative flow, covering all these points to make that surface plot. So instead, some scientists who are writing books and doing all this hydraulic analysis, looking at transients as well, they tried to characterize a bunch of different pumps ranging across all these different things and they non-dimensionalize them so that way we can use those data sets in our application. So while we don't have that information from the manufacturer themselves, we can take a data set, we can make it pretty close to what our pump looks like, and that way we can use the other quadrants of information because those pumps will be generally similar. So if we look at the different data sets that are available, again, manufacturers do not include that four quadrant information in their pump testing. Instead, what engineers will do is use a similar pump that they do have data for, that some scientist had spent a bunch of time uh, creating, and then they can dimensionalize it to be specific and close to their system's pump. So ultimately, this four quadrant data will replace the pump in the model. It'll override your specified pump curve, and that's why it's important to find a curve that matches pretty closely because otherwise you're going to introduce new uncertainty into your transient analysis, which obviously you want to minimize in your model. So these non-dimensionalized data sets, again, think about the scientists that went through the efforts of making those surface plots and turning them into uh, pseudo diagrams. They're most often based on specific speed. So specific speed we touched on in a previous webinar, but we'll go into a little bit here. Ultimately, it describes how axial or how radial a pump operates. So whether a pump is very high head at very low flow rates or very low head at very high flow rates, that can be described with specific speed. It's sort of like comparing a fan to a compressor. Both of those things are going to be on opposite ends of the spectrum, but treating a fan similar to other fans or treating a high pressure compressor compared to other high pressure compressors 
those things are going to be similar because of where they land on that spectrum. So using specific speed, using how axial or radial a pump operates, we can use that to find a analogous data set where we have those other quadrants of information. We can use that in our model to more accurately model uh, when operation goes into those other quadrants. There's still going to be uncertainty because those four quadrant data sets are representing a similar but not identical pump. So even if we find a pretty close analogy, there's still going to be some uncertainty because it's not going to be a perfect fit. Ideally, you would have the four quadrant data for your own system, but obviously that's not something that's realistic. So this is as close as we can get. As long as we can minimize that uncertainty, the better. So taking that non-dimensionalized data, which is all going to be an AFT impulse, not something you would have to import or bring in, then we just need the following information to dimensionalize it. So we would need the head curve, inform what that BEP head rate is. We would need efficiency and power data, one way to determine the best efficiency point, determining the head and flow rate at that point to dimensionalize it, and then also to determine the torque. And then the rated speed, which dimensionalizes the speed uh, axes of all of those different relationships. So how do we select a four quadrant data set? We want a data set that best matches our pump curve in our system. Again, we're trying to find a data set that matches the pump in our system. So that way, the closer it is in the first quadrant, the better representation it should be as we go into those other three quadrants. Here's a screenshot from AFT Impulse and our interface. So here we can see which data set we have selected. Again, they're denoted by this specific speed, which could be reported by your pump manufacturer and would be a good place to start. If not, we can estimate that specific speed for you and suggest it based on that. And it also tells you the reference of which scientists went through the efforts of uh, capturing that four quadrant data. Here's the dimensional reference point. We'll get into this in a lot more depth, but that will also inform how your four quadrant data set fits. So if we want to visualize it, it's a lot easier to picture when we can look at them. Here at the top, we have our specified pump curve. This is the actual pump that we have in our system, the curve generated and provided by the manufacturer. And the changing green lines, these are different four quadrant data sets that we're evaluating. So some of them you can see don't fit very well. So for example, these really high specific speeds, you can see they deviate quite a bit. And if we wait, we can see a pretty good fit like that one, which would likely be a better representation of our pump as it goes into that reverse flow area. So the selection considers a few different things. Initially, it'll be based on specific speed. If you use that automatic setting, that's exclusively what it'll be determined on. It'll also depend on the dimensional reference point, which we'll get into in just a moment, whether that's based on the best efficiency point or the steady state operating point. You can think of the dimensional reference point as how we're taking the non-dimensional curves that we just looked at and how we're expanding them into something that AFT Impulse can actually read. It can't read a non-dimensional 0.9 head, it can read a head of 200 feet, right? Finally, it's the engineer's judgment of fit. So again, going through the different data sets, seeing which one fits best, and then evaluating different options, ultimately doing sensitivity, which will be the recommendation towards the end of the webinar. This four quadrant data set will then replace the user specified pump curve during analysis. That'll lead to some potential discrepancies, which we'll go into, and just things that you have to be aware of and understand the consequences of as you're evaluating these different options. So let's jump back to the software real quick, just so we can take a look at that interface in more detail. So here in the pump properties window, we're looking at our four quadrant curve. Instead of automatically selecting it, which is based solely on this specific speed, we can do user selected and specify it. And here we can see all of those different data sets. So in this case, use with caution is off by default. These are data sets which for one reason or another may not be trustworthy. An example is if cavitation was occurring during their test, but they didn't actually avoid it, obviously that would skew your results. Or if they did not properly calculate that specific speed, that can be another concern where you may not want to use that curve for your system. 
but there's plenty of other options. What you can do is select one and then you can use the keyboard to kind of cycle through them. So here, obviously this seems like a pretty good fit. Let's see if we can find a better fit. That might be more than ideal. And then you can also look at different efficiency metrics, power, and then this suitor diagram, which now you understand what this means, even though you'll let the software do it all for you, right? So if we continue on with our comparison, again, we can see how the further and further we get, the more and more deviation that we see, especially when you get to these very high specific speeds, depending on which pump that you're using. If you have a high specific speed pump in your system, these would probably be a better representation. And then the suggested data set, again, calculated from your pump curve, or you can specify it if need be. All right. So that's how you select a four quadrant data set. Again, you're looking at all of these different things to evaluate. It's primarily based on specific speed, but that's not always trustworthy or reliable. What I would do and what AFT generally recommends is doing visual inspection, making sure that it follows that pump curve pretty precisely, and then ultimately doing sensitivity analysis, determining the effects of your four quadrant curve selection and seeing how much that'll change your transient results as well. So dimensional reference points. So we have all of that non-dimensional data. How do we dimensionalize it? At first, we'll look at the impact to the initial operating point. So since the four quadrant data was originally non-dimensionalized based on best efficiency point, it is often best practice to use best efficiency point when redimensionalizing. So in this case, you have the four quadrant curve, Again, it's just a dimensionless relationship between flow, speed, and head. And now when you select best efficiency point, you know a head at that point, you know a flow at that point, those become your ones, and then you can re-dimensionalize your four quadrant curve. What that means is at this best efficiency point, you're gonna be exactly identical because that's the point that you're using to dimensionalize this curve. However, we can see with our initial operating point that that will cause a discrepancy. That's because the curves aren't the exact same, they're not gonna land at this exact point. So when using BEP to match a four quadrant set, that could lead to a deviation at steady state, unless you're sizing your pumps perfectly, all of them are operating at BEP, where your BEP is your initial operating point. Otherwise, there will be a discrepancy at that initial point. The more that your pump curve deviates from the best efficiency point, the worse deviation you're gonna see at steady state. So if you're within the preferred operating region, that's gonna be a lot closer to BEP. So any discrepancy you would see would be less significant than the further out you see. So if we instead drew a system curve here, you'd see an even more drastic difference or all the way out here, you'd see a further drastic difference. So BEP in general, I would say is best because that's what the original curve was non-dimensionalized from but you can also use the steady state operating point. So what that will do is match the initial operating point of the original pump curve. So now instead of using BEP as our one, one flow, one speed, one head, now we're using that initial operating point. So what that means is it guarantees our initial operating point is gonna be the same, but as you deviate from that, that could also lead to different discrepancies. So it could lead to less accurate transient analysis, but more importantly, it's fundamentally changing how that four quadrant curve is dimensionalized. Remember all this four quadrant data is non-dimensionalized based on the best efficiency point of the pump. And now we're just sort of picking an arbitrary operating point saying that's our new one and then forcing a curve that goes through it. So it's very important to be aware of this when you're doing sensitivity and doing comparisons. In general, BEP is best. I would have to have a very strong case to make an exception and use operating point. At least that's my own personal sentiment. So we can look at this with more realistic curves. This is kind of a simplified example case where again, we can see the dashed line is dimensionalized based on best efficiency point, And this green line is based on that operating point. In that case, it matches the initial operating point whereas BEP matches BEP, but you do see this discrepancy between those 
So high level summary, when you're using the best efficiency point for reference, there's potential for deviation at your initial operating point, but you're following the intention of the four quadrant data set. And when you're using the operating point, it'll match your steady state, but you're fundamentally changing how those curves were non-dimensionalized. So it could lead to more severe deviation during transient. Again, depends on how far you're deviating from BEP. And then also if you're going into the other quadrants, that could cause similar concern because you're kind of uh, molding the curve in a way that it wouldn't have been designed to do. And then again, the further from BEP, the more deviation you would see. Hopefully with a tool like Fathom or with Impulse, you're designing to get as close to your best efficiency point as possible. And so you can minimize that effect as well. So that's the impact on just the initial operating point. Obviously, AFT Impulse is a transient uh, application and reverse flow is usually a transient process. So there will be similar implications to your selection from your dimensional reference point. So in all cases, you're going to be replacing your specified pump curve with the four quadrant curve. Whether you're dimensionalizing it from your best efficiency point, from your operating point, if you're picking a suitable four quadrant curve or a terrible one, no matter what, it's going to replace your specified pump curve. So that'll impact your initial operating point as we've seen, but it can also impact the final operating point and then also the rate at which a transient event occurs. So if again, we look at our operating point dimensionalization, here we have our initial system curve. And here, if we look at a final system curve, here's the actual operating point from our manufacturer curve. And then here's the curve predicted by that four quadrant. So whether this deviation is significant, this difference in head and this difference in flow rate, obviously that depends on what you're analyzing, but it's something to be aware of that this could be a concern, especially if you're trying to design for something like a final flow rate or what's the lowest pressure that you would see in the system. Here's a more complex example, again, where you have the best efficiency uh, dimensional reference point and then the initial operating point dimensional reference point. And here how you can see the final system curve that will also lead to some discrepancy. So this will be independent of how far away you are from BEP. It just depends on how well those four quadrant curves are gonna be matching that original manufacturer's curve. To touch on the rate of transient event impact. So depending on how this curve is shaped, it might ramp up and cause higher head here. As we saw with our software example, which we can jump back to. Here we can see how we get very different approaches to this reverse velocity, depending on which model that we picked. And depending on that, that can inform something like a check valve slam. So if fluid decelerates faster, check valve is going to allow more reverse flow, more likely to slam. Or if you're looking at the surge side, how those pressure surges might interact, the severity of a uh, pressure wave front, I guess and how that interacts with other pressure wave fronts that can also be impacted by these dimensional curves. So because you're fundamentally changing a specification in your model, you're moving away from that manufacturer curve to a four quadrant curve, it's important to make all of those considerations. Finally, since four quadrant and pump trips are often analyzed together, we can compare it to a normal inertial pump trip. This is reliable, again, if your reverse flow is limited. So if you never go into the other quadrants, then obviously a normal standard pump curve would be best. And then you can still use that to compare to as an additional reference point, depending on the amount of reverse flow. So some analysis considerations, we'll go through this and then we'll touch pretty quickly on a example model. Again, it's much more important in my mind to understand these concepts and then see where in the software you go and specify it and do the analysis than going through all the steps of specifying, creating scenarios and things like that. So we'll go through these considerations and then we'll touch on a final example, which is one of our example files. And if you need more information towards the end of the webinar, we'll have some additional resources that you can review. So some of the other considerations when doing this type of analysis and selecting four quadrant data sets is that they're gonna have their own uncertainty. So in some cases, like I mentioned, a particular data set might have had cavitation in its uh, results and the author just didn't deal with it and just said, this is the head that I reported isn't accurate at all. 
In other cases, the specific speed might not have been calculated correctly for the reported data. And so in a lot of cases, that's why it's important to visually inspect it, make sure that it's representing the pump in your system accurately. So that way, when it goes into those other quadrants, you can trust that that reflects the pump in your system. There could also be gaps in the data set. So because it is a range of specific speeds, not every specific speed is gonna be accounted for. That can make it challenging to find an exact match. Again, it's how close can you get? As they say, close only counts in hand grenades, horseshoes, and four quadrant data analysis. Small deviations in your four quadrant selection, whether that be from the data set that you select or from the dimensional reference point, the BEP or the steady state operating point, that could lead to significantly different transient results. So as we've seen, it could change the final operating point, it could change the rate of those transient events, which could lead to different amounts of reverse flow, and then difference in your analysis conclusions. This is especially important in your atmospheric or cavitation conditions. So if you do have a low pressure event, whether something pulls a vacuum on your pipe and could collapse it, or if it cavitates, and now you have to worry about those high pressure spikes when those vapor pockets collapse, both of those could be concerns. And one of the big reasons that you want to compare and do a lot of kind of sensitivity analysis on this uh, particular set. Because you're introducing uncertainty with the four quadrant, how do you try to minimize that by looking at a few of them, determining the effect of it on your results? So for example, you could do this four quadrant analysis, you could do all the sensitivity, and you could find that it really doesn't matter and it's pretty negligible compared to the uncertainty of your model and of your analysis. So if you're worried about uh, which four quadrant best represents your pump, but you don't have any manufacturer data for your valve that you're slamming closed or how long that takes, maybe you wanna refine other parts of your model before diving into this four quadrant aspect. In general, try to do sensitivity to get a range of confidence. So let's take a look at what that sensitivity could look like. So here we'll say goodbye to our simplified example. We'll save it and then we will close it out. And here what we have is one of our example files. So you can find all of these example files from the help menu. You can go to show examples. In this case, we'll look at the metric units, which I have pulled up here. And from here, you can open up a completed model. You can poke around. It eliminates a lot of the stress of building it and engineering uncertainty of, did I build it right? Are these results what I anticipate? Because you have an example to reference. So in this case, it's a little bit long because as we've seen, four quadrant analysis is kind of complicated, but it's gonna cover a lot of those same themes and a lot of those same topics that we've talked about today, just in written form and a lot more uh, thorough comparison. So here what we're going to look at is a case where we're transitioning our flow from tank B at steady state, and then we're going to open up valve A and turn flow to tank A. In the middle of that event, after these valves change, we're going to see an unanticipated pump trip. Again, if we're pumping uphill, that would be a cause for reverse flow. So we'll see reverse flow occur through this pump as this emergency shutdown valve closes and it closes kind of gradually, allowing pretty significant reverse flow through this pump. So by default, we're gonna include our standard pump curve. That'll be one of the uh, options that we evaluate. And then from here, we have a parent scenario, and we've created all these different children where we can select our four quadrant data. So in this case, we're looking at the four quadrant based on BEP. So if we specify the model, Again, here's where you would do your visual inspection to compare what four quadrant data you're using and what pump curve you actually have in your physical system. Again, you can compare efficiency and power as well. So they've done that for all of these different cases. Here they're looking at best efficiency point compared to the steady state operating point. And then here we can see some other data sets as well. So all of these were cloned from this parent scenario. So the only thing that we're varying is that four quadrant data set. Again, we're doing sensitivity and isolating that variable for our analysis. If you're unaware, you can also batch run these scenarios. So let's say you have all of your child, you can add all of these scenarios. That way you can run all of them in sequence. You don't have to run, wait for it to finish, hit okay, select the next one, run it, 
So it's great when you want to do sensitivity and compare all these different variables. Here we've already got output for all of them, so we'll go to one of them and we'll go look at those graph results again. So here's some pre-made graphs that we can evaluate. Here we'll look at pump speed versus time. Again, this is a pump trip event, so it's not going to be fixed at that constant speed the entire time. We will see how the pumps trip, and we can see how they all trip differently depending on the torque that's pulled from those uh, four quadrant data sets. So we can see the, the black, excuse me, the black manufacturer's curve, and then we can see how those data sets as well, where blue and yellow, you can see the similarity, the difference being from the uh, dimensional reference point, one is steady state, one is best efficiency point, and then these other curves as well. So it's convenient because you can make a transient graph for one scenario, and then using this multi-scenario button, you can select different scenarios, and here we can see all of those different cases that we set up for our sensitivity analysis. So if we wanted to isolate a few, we could do that as well. And it just makes it very convenient to, at a glance, set up all of your different scenarios, evaluate them all at the same time, try to understand the implications of the data set that you're selecting. We can look at other variables. So here we have velocity. Here we see maybe a bit wider deviation. Again, it's hard to tell because it depends on what you're looking for, what your criteria for design and whether a system is safe or not. So here we can see the peak velocity is very different and the amount of reverse flow that occurs through the pump is also quite different. We can also look at the pressure. So in this case, this would be the pressure response of the emergency shutdown valve, where here we can look at, again, what would be our peak pressure and what would be our minimum pressure kind of giving us a range of confidence depending on what we're trying to analyze and what the intention of our transient analysis is. And then again, you can always add other variables. You can look at how the valve CV closes. They should all be the same for this case because that's not a variable that we're trying to isolate across these different scenarios. So that's how you would perform the sensitivity analysis is create a bunch of different scenarios, go into each one from that four quadrant selection you can specify a model, evaluate it visually. So again, I recommend going through kind of one by one and then ultimately seeing what is the consequences of that. If it deviates pretty significantly across your different data sets, that might be a concern and you might have wider tolerances on your recommendations. But if they're all pretty similar, then the four quadrant data set probably doesn't make that much of a difference in your transient analysis. So. If you take one thing from this webinar, do sensitivity, you get a range of confidence you don't know until you try, which is kind of the point of a lot of our modeling software in general. So we've made it to the summary. We'll look at a kind of high level summary because I know it's a lot. You can always come back and watch the webinar and work through examples. So reverse flow can damage the system's components if not addressed and create additional transient events for an engineer to address. So for example, check valve slam. If you have a check valve at your pump outlet and reverse flow occurs, some of it will go through the check valve, and then it suddenly brings it to a stop, causing a pressure uh, increase. So the severity of that, that can be informed by how accurate your four quadrant data is, which is why it's important to select a good set that'll be suitable in those conditions. Modeling reverse flow requires data beyond the first quadrant of pump operation, so beyond the normal pump curve. Where do we get that information? Well, manufacturers don't give it to us, but we can use an analogous data set to approximate our pumps in our physical systems. All these data sets were non-dimensionalized, and so we re-dimensionalized them based either on our best efficiency point or our steady state operating point, both of which will have implications on the model and then the resulting transient analysis that you perform. It's best to do sensitivity. Again, try to experiment, see what the consequences are, especially with Scenario Manager, it's very convenient to test all those different alternatives. That'll give you a range of confidence for a transient response. Again, it's how do you look at the worst case scenario without creating so much uncertainty that you're over-designing and you're adding bladders or much stronger pipes than you need. So some additional resources. I know it's a lot of information. It was one of the topics that I was kind of uh, nervously excited to tackle. <laughs> 
We have a series of technical papers. They're actually attached in the webinar if you're watching live or they should be in the description of the YouTube channel if you're watching a recording. And so a lot of this addresses those same concepts, the fundamentals of four quadrant pump data, where do those torque curves and head curves come from, some different applications and the implications on your analysis. And then finally, the questionability of some of those pump sets and whether they're quality or not why some of those pump sets are used with caution, some are preferred, some are average. The help documentation, also super helpful, especially if you have a specific question about what's going on in the software. And then finally, that example that we looked at, selecting a pump, a pump for quadrant curve, where it'll provide a model, it'll walk you through all the steps. You can check your work and make sure that you understand it. Again, it'll go in much more depth than we do in this webinar here. I want to thank everyone for attending, especially if you've made it this far. I know engineering time is expensive, so I'm happy that you can spend it on this hour and hopefully create a lot more value for not only for yourself, but for the systems that you're analyzing. If you have any remaining questions, which I'm sure you do, feel free to email them to webinars at AFT.com and we'll do our best to answer them. With the turn of the new year, we're always looking for new topics for future webinars. You can submit a topic to webinars at AFT.com, whether that's the industry you work in, the applications that you look at, if you've run into a weird problem that you don't know how to solve, feel free to submit a topic. We'd love to consider it. Again, thanks to everyone, especially if you've made it to this point, and best of luck modeling your reverse flow in the future. We look forward to having you in a future Applied Flow Technology webinar early next year, and look forward to seeing you again soon enough. Thanks.